Why do we go to church in the first place? Why do we assemble as a body of Christ? Well, the answer for the sacramental traditions is to receive the grace of the sacrament. And particularly within the Episcopal Church, Anglican Church, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and many other denominations, the answer for those churches is to receive Christ. The Church has over and over again said, this is a real action that we are participating in, an objective action of receiving Christ's body and blood, and therefore it has some ramifications. In other words, when we partake of the sacrament, when we partake of the body, partake of the blood, we are, in a real sense, partaking in Christ's outpouring of himself for us through his death. God died for us that we might be able to receive God in the realest sense, but also Christ lives again on the third day so that as the scriptures would say, he might fill all in all. Some early church theologians attribute this to Christ's objective action in the sacrament. But you might be thinking, especially as it comes to us in the current pandemic that we are facing, there have been long times where we have not perhaps been able to receive the Holy Communion, or for many of us, not been able to receive the sacrament in both kinds, in the bread and the wine. For many within the United States, and indeed many within the um, wider world, there had been a time where we have restricted the use of one or both. And so what does that mean for the reception of Christ? Well, there have always been extreme circumstances where the church has withheld elements for the public but has not withheld the sacrament. And indeed, this is seen uh, within the Middle Ages, especially within the plagues that happened during the Middle Ages, whether it be the Black Plague or others such as that, which primarily gives rise to the giving of the bread only by, uh, uh, for many within the medieval church and not the wine as well. Since the um, 1960s in the Vatican Council, uh, the Second Vatican Council, the Roman Catholics have uh, reinstituted the reception of the chalice to the people. But there are always circumstances where, for reasons of public health, we refrain from offering both kinds. However, that doesn't mean that we don't still receive the presence of Christ in the sacrament. And indeed, the gathering together of us as church to receive Christ objectively is, for the sacramental tradition, the reason why we go to church. We go to receive Christ, chiefly in the sacrament of the Holy Communion. The realism of receiving the body and blood of Christ by virtue of Christ's death and resurrection is the realism of the early church, not meaning that we are um, thus receiving Christ and not being changed by Christ, and not receiving Christ and not being fed by Christ, which indeed is something that is good for us, but rather we gather to receive Christ because we cannot go on without Christ. We have to be sustained by Jesus. Our spirits have to be nourished by he who fills all in all. The reason why we push back against this notion of religion as therapy only is because this is a continual drawing into a deep mystery of the life of Christ himself. In what sense are we to understand the Holy Eucharist? What is it, in fact? One of the earliest traditions that we have of what the Holy Eucharist is, is that it is a sacrifice. Now, clearing up some of the confusion around what sacrifices are, we uh, return to perhaps the book of Hebrews within the Holy Scripture, where it says fairly plainly that we do not say that Christ is crucified again. Indeed, there was one sacrifice once for all in which Christ has been offered. 
Sometimes this is seen as a proof text against the realist idea that Christ is present within the Holy Eucharist as if Christ needed to be sacrificed again for our sins. But what um, Andrew Davison points out is that this is actually a poor understanding of what the idea of sacrifice is. In the early church, we understand that this Holy Eucharist, the Holy Communion, is a sacrifice of some sort. In fact, within the Bible itself, the Holy Eucharist, the institution of the Lord's Supper, happens within a sacrificial meal. It happens within the Passover meal, which in the Old Testament, in the institution of the Passover in the book of Exodus, it is actually spoken of by the Lord himself this is an ordinance and sacrifice for all generations. There is a sacrifice of a lamb, an offering of the lamb, the blood on the door. This is a sacrificial meal even from its beginning. When Jesus then institutes the new covenant of his body and blood, as he says within the context of that Passover meal, it is already within a Passover meal that is a sacrifice. And therefore, the early church who are Jews, really understand that this is a sacrifice being made. And Jesus himself says that in the meal. And so to remove sacrificial language as some, and to use Hebrews as some, sort of, uh, as some sort of proof text against a sacrifice of Christ is a fairly to ignore the meal context in which this happens. And perhaps not to understand really what a sacrifice is to begin with. Well, one of the great um, preachers of the church, St. John Chrysostom, wrote concerning the sacrifice of the Holy Eucharist. And he has the following to say in what, he, what we would come to know as, again, the realist understanding of the Holy Eucharist as a sacrifice in and of itself. Here's what St. John says. I wish to add something that is plainly awe-inspiring, but do not be astonished or upset. This sacrifice, no matter who offers it, be it Peter or Paul, is always the same as that which Christ gave his disciples and which priests now offer. The offering of today is in no way inferior to that which Christ offered because it is not men who sanctify the offering of today. It is the same Christ who sanctified his own. For as the words which God spoke are the very same as those which the priest now speaks, so too the oblation is the very same. So St. John Chrysostom, early church preacher, pushes back on the notion that this is another sacrifice. Rather, St. John connects the dots between the timelessness of what Jesus has done with what we perform in church today. In other words, it's not by our power. It's not by our gathering together. It's not by any other factor that Christ is made present. Rather, it is because Christ is present that Christ is made present through his promise that the church gathers together to receive, not the other way around. So as St. John would plainly put it, whether it be St. Peter or St. Paul, or whether it be someone in the 21st century, a priest offering the sacrifice of the Holy Eucharist, that it's not them who's sacrificing. It is Christ who is sacrificing of that one offering of himself. Thinking about it in a matter of um, time, we in modern day are being re-enjoined in time backwards to that one sacrifice of Christ once offered. It is not us in the act of gathering together that we ask Jesus to come again to be present. Rather, we are joining in with the one and a one and unified presence of Christ in that one sacrifice of himself once offered. We're not saying it's another sacrifice, and indeed the church has never said that, as St. John puts it plainly. In the Protestant Reformation, there is a conception that there's a re-sacrificing of Christ, but rather Chrysostom and others would say, this is not the case, because it's not we who sacrifice. Indeed, it's not the priests who sacrifice. Now, this is a common understanding at the Middle Ages, that it's the priests who are sacrificing a new sacrifice of the Mass, 
This was actually corrected in one of the councils that happens after the Reformation in the Roman Catholic Church. So this is not a, this is not a criticism that it doesn't have any warrant, but rather the church universal has always said these things. The church in every age makes mistakes, but rather the theology of the church in the real presence doesn't change about this sacrificial language. And indeed, it is because of the nourishment of Christ and Christ's offering it himself, not us, that makes it all the more important for us to recognize today that we gather to witness and receive the sacrifice of Christ that he himself makes. But Christ's sacrifice is unique. This is something that Christians have claimed even since the writings of the Holy Scriptures themselves. Once again, going back to Hebrews, in that same passage of Christ's one sacrifice for all, that passage of Hebrews in its context is getting at that Christ undid the futile cycle of sacrifice that had to be done every single year. In other words, it was Christ's one sacrifice once for all that did away with the need for these sacrifices of goats, oxen, so on and so forth. It is Christ's one sacrifice that fulfills all of those requirements, and those are no longer needed. Which points us to something important, that the sacrifice of Christ puts an end to all other forms of sacrifice necessitated for our salvation. Christ's sacrifice of himself was once for all covering the whole of the salvific process. In other words, now salvation is open to all by Christ's sacrifice. And indeed, through baptism, we approach that sacrifice by entering into the death and resurrection of Christ. Sacrifice in the lowercase sense of continual sacrifices, so on and so forth, sacrifices of, you know, time, effort, money, these things that we talk about as sacrifices in modern day, have to be understood as woefully inadequate to the one sacrifice of God on our behalf. Therefore, there is an end, there is a teleology, a goal of sacrifice. And it is that it is God's sacrifice that indeed is the one and true sacrifice for the whole world. Perhaps the most obvious part of the Holy Eucharist is the fact that it is feeding. It is a partaking of food. And this feeding aspect indeed, once again, is part and parcel of the sacrifice itself. Within the Old Testament, sacrifices, burnt offerings, were indeed offered to God of the first fruits. But you need to notice within the Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy passages that there are a portion of those sacrifices that are meant to be set aside for the priests and the Levites and those who are offering the sacrifices for their daily portion of food. It is a sacrifice, it's also a meal. This is so connected in our understanding of the Jewish culture of the early Old Testament, and indeed even in Jesus' immediate context of the Holy Eucharist, that sacrifice and feeding are so inseparable that we have to be able to understand that that is an immediate context. When we gather together for food in modern day, we simply don't have that intense connection between the food that we are partaking of together as a shared ceremonial meal and a sacrifice offered to God. This is something that was so intuitive to these, this particular circumstance in the Gospels themselves that it wasn't even needing to be mentioned. But it needs to be mentioned again in our context. Because feeding in the Holy Eucharist is part of that incorporative aspect of the body and blood of Christ to the community gathered. Once again, we don't gather together to make Christ present. Because Christ is present is why we gather. 
And because Christ is present in specifically in the real body and blood, we come to be incorporated as his body and we come to feed on Christ who alone can sustain our souls. Or as Jesus himself would say, we don't live upon bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Something other than mere sustenance, but a sustenance that is a sacrifice made holy. And in this feeding, this is part of indeed that incorporation into the body, because we are coming not just to eat individually, we're not coming just to have our own little time with Jesus. We are coming as a community in Christ to receive a shared meal together, and one that is intensely focused on equality of all people. One that incorporates every single person in the room. There is no person within the baptized of the church that is rebuffed from receiving that common meal. There's a reason why the church continuously says this sacrament is for the community. This is not an individual sort of action. This is something that is sustaining for the body of Christ, which is the gathered church. Part of that incorporation is not just we coming together as a body to receive the body and blood of Christ, but that we are made members of one another, as our prayer book in the Episcopal Church would say. We are not merely coming together as baptized people from various parts of our towns or cities or places like that individually to receive the Holy Communion coming forward. Rather, we have been made members of one another. Putting this in biblical language, we are one body. No member of the body can say, I have no need of you, as St. Paul would say. The hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you, so on and so forth. So also, we are made members of one another. We are mystically tethered to each other in a real substantial way. We are made one body, and therefore we are one family. We are made of one lineage, and indeed we are made of one people. What, no matter where we come from, no matter what our exterior looks like, no matter how tall, short, light-skinned, dark-skinned, no matter if we speak English or not, so on and so forth, everything exterior, no matter what those things are, we are then made members of one another. And that's the deep incorporative aspect of the Holy Eucharist. If we all are the body of Christ, if we are the baptized people, what does that mean when we have intense disagreement with other denominations? We in the Episcopal Church are not in full communion with our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. We are not in full communion with the Eastern Orthodox Church. We are in communion with many other people, and indeed, of course, within the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church as a whole, but those particular ties of communion can be strained. Disagreements over theology, doctrine, and intensely important doctrines indeed leads to the break of those ties, the um, dissemination of the body. Well, what does that mean for communion? Different people handle it in different ways. Andrew Davison, writing from an Anglican perspective, knows this intensely. The Anglican Church across the world, while a communion, have deep dividing differences. As part of the church, that is just where we are as people. We're human. It's hard for us to get along. But the thing is, is that communion is not ours. And that needs to be stated over and over again. The Holy Communion of the body and blood of Christ is not ours that we own. And indeed, it is God's. It is Christ's alone. Hence why it is Christ who makes communion. 
It is Christ who sanctifies, Christ who is the sacrifice. It is Christ whom we enjoin in that Holy Communion, not the other way around. And so because it is not ours to own, but it is a gift of God, the incorporative aspect of the Holy Communion continues to work out that particular incorporation, even in spite of intense difference. There's a reason why we pray that the Church may be one as God the Father and the Holy Spirit and Christ our Lord is one. But honestly, it's probably not going to be that way until Christ comes again. But rather, we partake of the Holy Eucharist because this is the token and promise of the real communication of the grace of God that we might be one. That it might break down those dividing barriers. That it might destroy the dividing wall that separates us. So how often do we receive Holy Communion? In, in what ways should we receive Holy Communion? I was recently told uh, by someone that there are denominations that have particular understanding that you only receive Holy Communion on Sundays. The difference between the way that certain uh, expressions of the Church handle this is determined in large part by our Church history. For example, the, one of the councils of the Church mandated for Christians that they must receive Holy Communion at least once a year, particularly on Easter. There was a hesitance to receive the Holy Communion due to good reason, recognizing that this is really Christ that you're partaking of, that this is really a holy thing that you are, that you are doing, and in uh, the language of St. Paul's injunction of examination of oneself, examine yourselves that you do not partake unworthily, that is something that many are seeing within the early church as reasons to not receive as often as potentially they should. Now, I think that, I think in modern day, we kind of have the opposite problem, where it is the understanding that when we come together as church that we receive, but that we need to recognize the examination of ourselves as it comes to the reception of this incredibly real and incredibly potentially dangerous thing. We are doing something profound by participating in receiving the body and blood of God. We are doing something profound when we say that we believe we are receiving sustenance in a very real sense from the one who created you and me. That is profound. That's also something that should give us pause to examine ourselves, not to refrain from Holy Communion, but to recognize what's going on. This is why, in the early church, there was encouragement to fast, to abstain from food before receiving the Holy Communion. And in fact, in modern day, this is still encouraged in a lot of places of maintaining the Eucharistic fast. This is what this is called. Where the first meal one receives every day would be the Holy Communion. Now, this is most certainly not uh, practical in every single place. However, there are some particular practicing people who see this as a particular understanding of what should be done. This is something that needs to continue to be done, or at least offered in some way, so that we continue to receive in an understanding manner. And fasting is one of those spiritual practices that always refocuses us on God's provision. But receiving the Holy Communion especially in the Episcopal Church, is something that we do as gathered community because Christ is present. And so the reception of Holy Communion when we gather as people is indeed something that the gathered people should expect on Holy Eucharist days that we celebrate it. That doesn't replace our daily prayers, but rather it is the source and summit of our Christian life, as one of the catechisms would say. It is that thing that we receive when we come to church because Jesus is here. 
We come to church because we know that that's where particularly we partake of these things. And that's what binds us together as community in the frequent reception of Holy Eucharist. You'll find this throughout all denominations, particularly in John and Charles Wesley's writings within the Methodist movement. They encouraged frequent communion. They encouraged the constant reception of these things because of the importance of it. And I think in a parting note, it's uh, no better person to talk about this than Evelyn Underhill, one of the great mystic theologians of the Anglican Church. Listen to what Evelyn says. Here the Church, the mother of souls, looking towards Calvary, takes up the ancient tokens of sacrifice and lifts them up to eternity in the name of Christ her High Priest, and with them satisfies her children's hunger and thirst. By this unceasing giving and receiving, the whole of life is to be Eucharistized. This is the Christian task. It is to be offered, blessed, and made the vehicle of that infinite self-giving, of which our small, reluctant self-giving is a faint shadow on earth. We are meant to be caught up in, incorporated in, and sent out with the real presence of Christ that is meant to be communicated to the rest of the world.